So, hello all, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Please be welcome. We are starting the workshop Children's right, Digital Rights, Overcoming Regional Inequalities. For those who are following us online, there's the possibility of simultaneous translation within the transmission, transmission channel, okay? So, I'm Maria, representing Alana Institute, an NGO from Brazil which aims to honor children on and offline, and it's a pleasure to be here. Moderating this panel with me is Manu Halford, who's keeping up with uh, the discussion online as well. And acting as a reporter online, we have Thais Rugolo, Rugolo, also from Alana Institute, whom I would like to thank a lot in advance for her work contributing on, on a very critical thinking for this panel organization. So to warm up the discussion we're propo proposing now, I bring some context elements from Brazil. We had a very hard year in Brazil. The effects on f of the digital world impacted the directly, directly on the life and security of Brazilian children and teachers in schools. Attacks were organized in digital platforms against children. Adolescents were recruited and local socioeconomic vulner vulnerabilities were exploited to cause hate and violence. Today, we had one new attack at the school in Brazil, for which we are very sorry and mourned. Misinformation invaded the online debate and made families and children extremely anxious about their own safety. This chain effect was expanded because of the business model and design of digital platforms privilege and even profit from violence controversy. The proliferation of betting models that promise social ascension through the exploitation of money. The dissemination and dependency of mostly northern edtech models that consume and share Global South children's personal and collective data for commercial, commercial exploitation and lack transparency. Those are all complex social issues being faced right now. We, as the global majority, have our own complex problems that come from an historical social economic context and because of that, legislation, implementation, and public policies for child rights need to address context and in spe specific social issues. Because of the special vulnerability of children, the digital environment can present both opportunities and risks for them, as you know. In this regard, national and international efforts have been mobilized to promote a safe and rights-enhancing digital environment, the most important being the general comment to any number 25, from the Committee of the Rights of the Child. Nevertheless, the lack of national regulations governing the online environment makes children's digital experiences highly vulnerable to social, cultural, and economic contexts, particularly with a prevalence of discriminatory processes that, that disproportionately affect countries in the Global South. In Brazil, civil society is working hard now to approve a regulation inspired by DSA, which brings rules for the protection of children on platforms, starting from the demand for transparency and accountability. So this session aims to discuss paths to a safer digital environment for children, regardless of their location. To achieve this, recently approved, the poli approved policies and their potential to, for global impact will be analyzed alongside the remaining obsta obstacles that need to be addressed for effective regulation, especially in countries of the Global South, taking into account especially the application of general comment number 25 in Latin America. Now I'd like to present two quick videos where uh, children from Brazil contribute with their perspective on issues that they face online and opportunities as well on the internet. Please, Manu. No sound. Oh. 
We're facing some trouble, some issues, but mm. yeah, just a second, <laughs> sound issues. Yes, I think we may go strictly to our debate and then we try again to to run the videos. Is it okay? Do we want to try once more? <laughs> no. No, no. Sorry. Fecha você então, tá legal? Incrível. Porque você vivia antes da internet. É. Aí você achava muito mais legal. É. O Lunetas falou com crianças de todo o Brasil para saber como elas imaginam o mundo antes da internet. Eu tô falando que eu sou de internet, né? Quase ninguém ia saber de nada. Nossa, imagina, coitado das pessoas, né? Sim, às vezes eu penso com uma, eu penso e falo pra uma mãe, nossa, como vocês conseguiam não pode, quando vocês estavam com sede, o que vocês faziam? Muito ruim, ninguém podia jogar nada, não podia assistir vídeos. Legal e sem graça ao mesmo tempo. Porque antes da internet todo mundo olhava no olho, todo mundo, as crianças não ficavam assim por tanto tempo no celular brincado. Bem era um pouquinho melhor, porque as pessoas não tinham que se preocupar com sua imagem social, né? As crianças brincavam mais, em vez de ficar assistindo desenho, jogando jogo no celular, pra tablet. Os adolescentes não ficam todos. Os adolescentes não ficavam toda hora mexendo no celular. Porque a internet, depois que lançou, é assim, ficou na cabeça de todas as crianças e ficou o vício maratom. Um vício assim. O tamanho de dois mundos se encantando. Elas brincavam de coisas que dava pra brincar. Tipo peão, é, e Kong Kong, pega-pega. Porque na época era pra brincar na rua. Não tem problema na violência. E hoje em dia tem. Eu acho que antes da internet as pessoas prestavam mais atenção no mundo. Sim. As pessoas iam na casa das outras, não precisavam falar pro chat. E também, né, as pessoas não precisavam ficar naquele vício de comprar o celular novo que lançou. Como seria se não existisse mais internet no mundo? Horrível, <risos> difícil, impossível. Assim, o mundo, claro, não ia acabar, mas eu ia ficar meio preocupada, eu ia. Nossa, só de falar de me deu uma tristeza. Eu ia desmaiar. Eu simplesmente ia começar Cadê a internet? Meu que ela foi? Não iria nem pensar na vida Não vai ter nada pra fazer Aí eu ia ficar quieta em casa Eu ia ficar no quarto sem comer Sem fazer nada cinco dias E aí depois desses cinco dias eu teria que superar Ai, eu ia ficar bem chateada Construía robôs e mandava Usar os robôs para construir internet. Eu acho que sair mais, vira, ficar ao ar livre, andar de bicicleta, andar de patins, skate, essas coisas. Eu ia ficar só me o dia inteiro. Eu ia parar para usar um pouquinho o banheiro ou fazer um pouquinho. Se a internet fosse um brinquedo, que brinquedo seria? Seria um ursinho com uma Tela na, na barriga do ursinho. Mas, tipo, um robô assim, que você pergunta um negócio pra ele. Ah, o que que tá acontecendo? Sei lá, o que que é isso? dele te responde assim, blá blá blá, tipo um Wikipedia. Provavelmente seria um boneco 
Só que não é um boneco básico, entendeu? Que ele andava sozinho, que ele tomava água sozinho, que te dava o que você pedisse. Eu acho que seria aqueles telefones que a gente ganha quando tem 4, 5 anos, que você faz e digita números qualquer e aí toca uma musiquinha. Acho que a internet seria um brinquedo bem grande, assim. Um brinquedo que desse pra todas as pessoas brincarem. Um carrossel, por quê? Um carrossel roda e a internet também roda para todos os lugares do mundo. We have one more. Is it possible? Is there another one? Ah, thank you. There is one more? One more video. Eu acho que tem duende no meu celular escutando minhas conversas e me mandando anúncios de coisas que eu nem preciso. E foi assim que o cartão de crédito estourou esse mês. Eu desconfiaria de algum hacker. Os hackers, eles acabam sabendo da sua vida. Duendes eu sei que não, né? Mas eu sei que tem pessoas que vê todos os nossos dados, que eles ficam guardados. <risos> Eu vejo coisas na internet que realmente me fazem muito mal. Fico quieto para não me acharem um velho chato. Mas sempre eu vejo coisas que eu sei que são ruins e parecem maldade. Tem alguns vídeos que me magoam. Racismo, né? Já devia ter acabado. Né? Nesses dias eu vi um vídeo, né? Da mulher, ela oferecia ou um presente de surpresa ou dinheiro, né? Aí quando eles iam abrir, era uma banana ou um macaco. Ah, eu acho que foi uma maldade, né? Também eu só fazia com crianças e com, com pessoas negras. Vi um vídeo no TikTok me prometendo uma carreira de modelo. Eu estava acreditando, até minha família também. Mas o perfil começou a pedir pix. E mais pix. Era bom. Quase acreditei também. A minha tia, ela deu lá na tela dela, clique aqui para retirar seu dinheiro. Ela clicou e deu vírus no celular dela. Comecei a acreditar nessa história de aposta online. Perdi todo o meu dinheiro. Não pago mais o PVA. Perdi o carro também. É isso, a casa sempre ganha. Não dá pra acreditar que tem gente divulgando isso livremente. Coisa de doido, hein? Aqui com o cara foi apostar, perdeu tudo. Teve uma vez que eu instalei um jogo que influenciadores estavam postando muito, que tava ganhando dinheiro, só deu errado e eu tinha que trocar de celular. Com esse dinheiro que eles ganham, é todo o dinheiro que os pobres vão perdendo ao longo da, das apostas, né? O pessoal pode até trapassar e você não sabe. Thank you. These videos were produced by Alana and Lunetas, a journalistic portal focused on childhood and are part of our advocacy efforts to put kids first on the online debate. So to kick things off, I'll give the floor to Mrs. Mikiko Utani, who is a member and the immediate past chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The child. She is an international human right, rights lawyer and a practicing lawyer of family law in Japan for over 30 years, with a focus on women's and children's rights. She has published and thought extensively in the area of international human rights and on issues impacting children. So Mikiko, uh, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, could you please start by telling us how you see the importance of the adoption of uh, general comment num number 25 for uh, the committee and how was the work of its adoption? Thus, uh, how do you see the right to non-discrimination in relation to the digital environment? Please, you have the floor. Thank you again. Thank you very much uh, for um, the introduction and also having me on this um, panel. Uh, so for those uh, who don't know much about the Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, let me begin um, by sharing with you a little bit about the committee. So you may know the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, that was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1989. And the uh, convention established the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, to monitor the implementation of the convention by the state parties, uh, those countries who um, 
ratified uh, the convention, which is now in 196, um, so almost universal ratification. And the committee is composed of 18 indi individual experts like me, and uh, we review the country reports periodically, periodically. And um, however, the country report and um, reviews and the recommendation um, after the review is uh, country specific. So from time to time, the committee also adopts uh, the documents which are called general comments, um, focusing on particular uh, rights or the issues uh, which are relevant uh, to the uh, children's rights under the conventions. So in, 19, in 2019, the committee decided to draft a new general comment on children's rights in relation to the digital environment and adopted it in uh, February 2021. And I was one of the members of the committee's working group on general comment 25 uh, who um, uh, drafted uh, this new general comment. So the committee's decision to choose this topic uh, was because of its recognition of importance of providing guidance on how the child rights under the convention should be promoted and protected. Uh, what are the obligations of states and responsibilities of business sector? How children uh, should be empowered and supported? How parents should be also supported? So uh, in 2019, we already saw uh, the digital were immersed in children's daily lives. And we thought that uh, because, as I said, that the convention was adopted in 1989, so uh, we need to um, show how the convention applies uh, to the um, now children's lives, uh, we, who, because children live uh, in uh, online and offline you know, seamlessly. But uh, when the General Comment 20 was adopted in February 2021, we realized that uh, its importance was much more uh, than we originally thought. Uh, you may understand um, several reasons. First of all, it was because of the impact of COVID-19. We witnessed the increasing impact of online on children's lives in both ways, positive and negative. Positive, of course, uh, for example, the continuation of education by remote uh, learning. Negative, of, co of course, we all, all know, uh, longer time um, exposure to online. And uh, so the longer time on online uh, for children also means that uh, more exposure to online bullying, online sexual exploitation, um, exposure to harmful um, content on online, and also impact on health. Um, and also, uh, we witnessed that existing discrimination was expanded uh, because of the more uh, use of online. Post-COVID-19, uh, digitalization continues. Uh, so uh, when the children don't have the access to um, digital, which means that children are excluded uh, from certain um, services, for example, um, the, also, we recognize that uh, humanitarian situation, uh, emergency situations uh, due to the disasters and the conflict, uh, many more children continue um, uh, on move or are displaced internally or and cross borders. Living in refugee campus and other countries uh, need for the children to access education, health services, information, identity documents, etc. It's, it's, it's significant and the digital plays a critical role. So this is about the importance of the general comment and we are very happy that the committee adopted GC25 in 2021. But I'd like to highlight uh, the issues related to the topic of this uh, workshop today, regional inequalities and that were experienced by ourselves, I mean by committee members in the drafting process. Because I said the uh, committee decided uh, to draft this new general comment in 2019. And generally we, take, uh, we put two years uh, in drafting process. So the second year of our drafting process was affected by COVID-19. So the committee couldn't meet in Geneva in person, so we continued our work online. And this was a very uh, in, useful experience in my view, uh, because we, we really realized by our own experience that 
there are other challenges some committee members were faced, uh, such as the difficulties or high cost in accessing, accessing internet or even electricity, lack of interpretation, uh, which was not provided online, time zone issues, um, some members in some regions, particularly in the global south, were more affected because of the access issue, uh, connectivity issue, high cost issue, and time zone, and language, I would like to add. So the, coming back to the uh, general comment 25, the right to non-discrimination of the child is recognized as one of the general principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So naturally and unsurprisingly, the GC25 recognizes this exclusion as discrimination against children, but identifies other issues beyond just a simple access. The committee states that, uh, I quote, the right to non-discrimination requires that state parties ensure that all children have equal and effective access to the digital environment in ways that are meaningful for them. So states should provide uh, free and safe access for children in dedicated public locations and invest in policies and programs that support all children's affordable access to and knowledgeable use of digital technologies. So um, it's not just access, digital literacy and education are also very critical. But next point, what is rather important in my view is that committee said, children may be discriminated against by their being excluded from using digital technologies and services by receiving hard, hateful communications or unfair treatment through the use of this, those technologies. Other forms of discrimination can arise when automated processes that result in information filtering, prof pro profiling or decision making are based on biased, partial or unfair obtained data concerning a child. So because of the time constraint, I will jump uh, to the uh, topic of this workshop, regional inequalities and how to overcome these challenges, which were not really addressed in the GC25. So what I'm going to say is just my personal uh, reflection, uh, not on behalf of the committee, I have to say. Okay, so three points. First, who are accountable for those regional inequalities? Who has responsibilities? I believe that uh, global policy, integrating regional inputs is necessary. As I said, the committee reviews country report and make country specific recommendation to each country. Uh, the committee cannot address uh, the whole you know, issues such as regional inequalities. I believe international cooperation in providing financial technical resources and support for capacity building, multilateral, multi-sectoral approaches are needed. And so the SDGs process, World Summit on the Information Society, uh, in inter Internet um, Governance Forum like this, and Global Digital Compact are very, very important um, global policy um, space. Secondly, participation of stakeholders whose rights are affected, in particular in the global south, is critical. So how we can ensure child participation from the global south uh, when uh, the global policy um, is discussed? Cost, access, language, information, a gap, all these need to be addressed to ensure meaningful participation of the children and young people from the global south. Finally, child rights impact assessment. This is, uh, the, I believe, the area that the business can um, play more role. Uh, when the business do child rights impact assessment, it has to include extraterritorial impact of the business models and practices affecting the children outside the territory, territory. and also transparency. When the uh, business disclose the information, it has to be in a language uh, which can be understood by the various part, the children uh, in various parts of the world. So that's uh, my um, contribution to this workshop. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mikiko. Thank you so much for your words and your work. General Comment 25 is really central for us to move forward. Uh, no, I'll quickly give the floor to Lily Edinen, 
who's a PhD student in information technology and a contributor to technology communities and speaks widely on issues related to internet with a particular interest in women, women and youth inclusion. Uh, from Ghana, okay. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Lily. And my question to you is, what are um, the specific challenges and risks that children and, and youth from Gra Ghana face nowadays on the internet today? or nowadays and today. <laughs> and what kind of international collaborations can be mobilized to promote children's rights to non-discrimination when using digital products and services while still keeping contextualized and local protagonism? This is so important. Right. Thank you, Lily. <laughs> floor is yours. Thank you, um, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those who are also joined us um, online. So my name is Lily Edina Mbochi. I'm from Ghana. And I'm also now, li I live in the US pursuing a PhD in IT with a focus on privacy. Um, as you shared, the work in the past has been pretty much along the lines of um, inclusion for youth. And when we say youth, um, in the past, it has bordered along the lines of people who are young professionals or people who are probably um, just past the teenage age. But when we talk about child um, protection and child rights online, then the issue of involving um, children who are lesser than the, the teenage age comes into play. So I'm going to share, be sharing what are the things that we've seen in the context of Ghana when it comes to um, child rights online and the, the things that are handled and how we can together rally support through international co um, corporations and partnership to make some of these things, um, to overcome some of these things so that children are protected online. Now, uh, the issue of child rights online in Ghana is a mixed one, stemming from the fact that there has currently been um, an active increase um, talking about awareness creation to ensure that people know what it is that's an issue, and especially for what we call the group of people that we call technology caregivers. So if you've ever had a child come to you and ask you how to probably put on their phones, or how to access a game, or how to access a software, you are a technology caregiver. If you, you, you guide your parent or an educator that guides children how to use some of these things, you are a technology caregiver. What we've seen currently is that um, there are issues around uh, digital literacy, as was mentioned. And in Ghana, one of the biggest one is also um, just people learning the whys be behind what um, the things that are online. How did they maximize the use? So for instance, um, if you were on Facebook, that is a good place for you to connect. But do you know if your data, um, I mean, sorry, your privacy has been breached uh, as, a as a tech caregiver so that you can also guide a child to be able to probably um, be online properly. Now, what we see is the electricity that comes from, uh, and I put literacy in code because there is the, there is the um, enlightenment, but not really the understanding that we see um, um, with, with people who are users, especially with the children. So the first specific issue that I'm bringing up is the issue around the digital literacy, and this also would be side by side what you know as access. So even though people are connected online, there is that huge gap still standing, and it's not everyone that is connected. So with a few people who are online, you also want to see how they are using the online spaces correctly in such a way that their rights are not also trampled upon even in the online uh, online um, scenes or the, the, the platforms they are on. Now, another one would be the issue of cyberbullying. For instance, people are online. I mean, they know that they're able to, um, for, for, example, um, for example, children would probably be doing competitions online with their, with their friends. They can do TikTok challenges. And somebody says some things that probably would hurt them. Um, they, it, 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 it internalizes. And they, they brood over, over them too much. And probably would think about self-harming. There is that issue of, also of exploitation. Uh, because a child posts something, somebody says, hey, I have this for you. Are you able to meet? me here for this and this and that. For somebody who hasn't been taught how to properly handle some of these things and sift through, who knows they may be a nest target and the, the, the results or the, the end of that simple, hey, I, I've got this for you, would be probably, um, I mean, very, it will be one that is huge and parents wouldn't be able to handle it, even can the child also. And I think that we see though is also just um, around I mentioned exploitation, the cyberbullying, and there's also where there's the um, 
content abuse sometimes it stems from just understanding of the content and children are caught up sometimes and they they probably wouldn't be able to backtrack and see how far they've gone with something that probably was mis misinformation or disinformation and they are caught up and online they get all the bashes again and they get all the um there's the there's a bullying that comes out again, and it just goes back to where they feel like they, they, they don't deserve to be on those spaces, and nobody is there to protect them. Now, these are some of the things that we see, but there's also, like for the tech caregivers that I mentioned, parents who are sometimes even helpless, educators who are helpless, and that's where we have the awareness creation and education that should be wider, um, cut across. Um, so much said that people who are supporting children know enough to be able to help them and children are also taught in a way that they also can consume content and understand with actionable um, steps for them to get around uh, some of the things that they encounter online. I know for a fact that uh, my niece who is 12 years, 12 years uh, because she knows that I'm in IT, she thinks I have all the answers. Thankfully, I know some. Her mother also knows some. But the thing is, there is that constant, what should I do? And there's that problem. If there was a place where they can get resources to learn, who knows it will be helpful. Now, looking at this in the context of Ghana, there is also the Ghanaian government stepping in right now to try to do things around this child protection. So um, there is the National Child Online Protection uh, Strategy that was um, launched, I think, uh, the year, I, can't uh, I don't have it right in my mind, but uh, th that's just a way to rally some support to say, we know there are harms online, there's a strategy we are looking at. Now, the implementation is a place where it gets um, a bit shaky. There is also the ratification by the Ghanaian government for the AU Convention on Protection and Welfare for Children Online. Helpful, but again, there's the implementation aspect. Now, we come to the part where there's legislation, there's legislation um, existing for areas of child pornography in Ghana, but it's not in its entirety covering everything that children can be exposed to on the online spaces. So for international co um, communica communities and what they can do to support the Ghanaian context, it will be that support to enact laws that are all encompassing to a large extent, covers different scenarios, different contexts, not only what you know right now as child pornography. There's also the need for, or if there's an, a support that can be um, gotten from international organizations to help local organizations. I know one of them that does amazing work is a child online protection, I think, program or something. There's a name for it. It's led by somebody called Awo Aidam. She's very vocal on why children should be protected and rights that should be upheld online, but they can make use of things like support, technical assistance, financial aid to push further the work that they do. There's also, um, for international support, there can be one around just um, getting um, more, more, more contextualized, um, let's say, uh, legislation and helping the Ghanaian, the Ghanaian community to, con to contextualize some of the things that are in the international jurisdiction for the country. That's because there are different scenarios for pretty much every place, and what may work in Ghana, or pr probably in Brazil, we probably would need, it, would need to be tweaked in a way to fit the Ghanaian context. So all these are ways that uh, we can essentially have support from the international bodies and still push what is local and help people to understand the things as it affects us the most as Ghanaians. Um, so I'll stop here and probably would continue when we ask some more questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lily. Inspiring reflections based on, based on your experience and the efforts being made on, in Ghana. Thank you so much. So now to bring us comments on the regulatory differences between the global north and south in the protection of children online, we'll listen to Sonia Livingston. She's a full professor in the, in the Department of Media and Communications, London School of Economics and Political Science. She has published 20 books on media audiences, children and young people's risks and opportunities, media literacy and rights in the digital environment. She directs the Digital Futures for Children and Global Kids Online with UNICEF. Um, unfortunately, due to time zone differences, it's three, AM in UK now. Professor Sonia won't be able to join us live, but she recorded very kindly her participation. Please, let's see it. Hello, 
My name is Sonia Livingstone. I'm a professor in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today for uh, this uh, really fascinating conversation. Much of my time as a uh, academic and researcher these days is concerned with children's rights in the digital age. And I thought I would begin by saying something about the key findings from my research in mapping the risks and opportunities for children online. Um, and I do this work as part of a large scale um, research networks in both Europe um, with originally funded by the European Commission and also internationally uh, as part of the Global Kids Online project uh, together with UNICEF Office of Research. So I'll say a little about the findings and then something about the implications for regulation and whether there's anything from the Global North that could be learned in the Global South. So for the findings, um, I would say in both Europe, uh, but also internationally, and we work um, through Global Kids Online increasingly in the um, Global South and across all continents. Um, it's always hard to summarize uh, findings from so many researchers and so many children over time, but crucially, um, the world is full of divisions and inequalities. And what we see over and again is how those inequalities perpetuate from offline to online settings. And so it is really vital to begin as a researcher, but also as a practitioner and policymaker with a recognition of the incredible variability and inequality that divides um, and differentiates among children, both within countries and between countries. As countries around the world gradually gain more internet access, there are all kinds of debates about how children should be uh, provided with this access. Um, I think it is now taken uh, that it is part of children's rights. It's certainly a really crucial means by which children access their rights. What research shows is a challenge for policymakers because it shows that as children gain more access to the internet, they both encounter more risks and more opportunities. The two go together and the really challenging question is whether we can allow and find ways for internet access to uh, maximise the opportunities that children uh, encounter while also mitigating the risks because without those kind of efforts at mediation and management, children will gain opportunities, but also risks. I find when taking research um, into policy and practical context, it isn't always clear what are the anticipated, desired or actual outcomes of interest. Um, a crucial one that we see as a, the research community is that children's encounters with risks may or may not result in actual harm. And that what matters is all the protective and vulnerability factors that um, make up their lives. And in fact, I could say the same for opportunity. You can provide children with digital opportunities, but that doesn't always translate into benefit because again, the protective and vulnerability factors serve to uh, undermine some of the opportunities to benefit um, and cause um, a range of, of, of challenges. So, Generally, what I could see from the research world is the importance of having up to date and disaggregated evidence that really re reflects the diversity and complexity of the conditions in which children live and the different circumstances that define their lives. In um, many contexts, researchers are doing their best to use this evidence to overcome moral panics and media panics um, to ensure that uh, policy interventions are really carefully targeted according to need um, and evidence is also very valuable to evaluate uh, which interventions or which um, programs and policies work and which ones don't so that we can really begin to build on past experience uh, successful as well as the failures and ensure that policy and practice um, improves. In the Global Kids Online project, we're really committed to the idea of comparative evidence, that we have the same measures used in different countries and contexts so that we can really um, set a kind of baseline against which different national and regional interventions can mark their progress. 
Um, and so I'd refer you to the Global Kids Online Toolkit, which has worked very hard with partners in many countries uh, to try to develop measures that are really effective and that speak to policymakers in, in those different countries. Um, I was asked in preparing this session um, to say a little about uh, some of those policy frameworks that we have been taking our research to. Uh, and here my experience is more European um, and um, the question is whether that has some value for policymakers in the global south. Clearly we have an emerging European model. Um, it has its own history and its own kind of cultural um, uh, shaping and I think it is it, it's a question for debate and I'm really glad we're debating it in this session uh, to determine uh, in what ways uh, others could learn from the European model and in what ways that might be inappropriate and a different model is needed. I think really strongly shaping the European model um, has been for a long for, for a while now, the emphasis on data protection through the general data protection regulation. Um, and if I was asked one thing uh, that I would recommend, I would say that now that the internet runs on data, uh, increasingly driven by data, uh, ensuring effective data protection in any country might make the biggest difference um, to the realization of children's rights as well as everyone else's rights in that country. And I could point here to the uh, spread of what are being called age appropriate design codes internationally. Um, we, um, regulatory formats which seek to protect and empower children in different digital contexts, um, but focused on data protection and the children's data subject rights, rather than, let's say, on content regulation, which often seems um, like censorship and can um, uh, lead to problems precisely for that reason. So I think there are interesting questions for any country about whether the regulation of data can uh, curb some of the commercial exploitation and algorithmic excesses of the attention economy and find ways to harness children's best interests in a rights framework also to their data subject um, rights. Um, I don't think that's the only um, uh, interesting thing about the European model and perhaps one other point um, I could I could mention here um, is the recent um, Digital Services Act, which uh, seeks a risk assessment, a risk assessed mechanism for thinking about um, uh, the, the protection of consumers. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of um, discussion of the Digital Services Act um, in this uh, Internet Governance Forum. Um, but I think the focus on, on, on risk assessment rather than, as it were, heavy handed top down uh, efforts to control technology, the emphasis on transparency, accountability and provision of remedy. Um, all of these are really crucial ways of ensuring that um, regulation is um, uh, fits the circumstance and uh, serves to empower the user. And I would exactly tie that back to the uh, child rights agenda and the evidence that I mentioned earlier, because what we hear from families um, really everywhere is the desire to kind of tailor uh, the digital environment to suit the family's choices and culture and to um, fit with uh, the particular needs or risks that children uh, face in different um, circumstances. Um, maybe just as a last word, um, it's been a learning curve for me on to work with uh, colleagues here and elsewhere um, in thinking how to build child rights into um, into the into internet governance. Uh, and I think there are some emerging models. One that I've worked on is the idea of child rights by design to really harness uh, the already uh, underway efforts at privacy by design, at safety by design, and security by design to really think holistically about the full range of children's rights, including their civil rights and opportunities, their rights to privacy, and of course to 
uh, protection and think um, how can we uh, embed all of those in the design of both the digital tools and services they use, but also um, digital policy that serves to uh, realize their rights. So child rights by design might be um, an, an idea that I would like to leave you with, and uh, I only wish I could participate uh, in uh, today's discussion further. Thank you. Professor Sonia, always so amazing bringing us researchers researches thoughts and innovation which are very useful for all of us now uh, to talk a bit more on data protection on south especially an inseparable topic to this discussion we have the online participation of Valdemar Gonçalves Ortuño Jr the president director of the Brazilian Data Protection Authority thanks for joining us Valdemar hope you're there already um, my main questions for you are recognizing the, the importance of the Data Protection Authority in protecting the digital rights of children and adolescents in Brazil. We would like to understand two levels of consideration. The first of it is how is the nation, nation, National da Data Protection Authority incorporating Brazilian children's rights into its governance, oversight, and fiscaliz fiscalization process? The second is is this process in any way influenced or inspired by international mechanisms or the actions of uh, all other data protection authorities? In other words, digital platforms regulation in the global north can impact regulatory frameworks in the, the south? And if yes, is this good? <laughs> and third, uh, last but not least, what are the main challenges that the authority faces in the day-to-day -day activities regarding children's rights? Please, Mr. Valdemar, the floor is yours. Bom dia, boa noite. Obrigado, Maria, pelas perguntas, pelo direcionamento da nossa fala. É um tema importante. Antes, eu gostaria de parabenizar a, a Lili, a Sônia, a Mikiko, pelas brilhantes apresentações. E lembrando que no Brasil, depois de amanhã, nós comemoramos o Dia das Crianças. Na nossa autoridade, hoje, nós trouxemos os filhos, as crianças que compõem a nossa família, a NDPD. We invited our children and the people who are, is, are part of... Uh our family and, and, and NPD, and this is a topic that we like to discuss. We discuss ardently aspects related to processing of personal data of children and adolescents and their rights are directly and indirectly considered in the ANPD regulatory processes. For example, directly speaking, it was uh, the subject of a specific statement on the legal hypothesis and appears as an item on the 2023-2024 regulatory agenda. Indirectly, it is a point that can be verified in other regulatory processes as occurred with the legitimate interest guide which counted on specific topics about processing of personal data of children and adolescents. Regarding inspection processes since May 2022, ANPD has been conducting uh, inspection processes and personal data processing carried out by the social network TikTok. The process focuses on personal data processing of children and adolescents and is developed in two prongs. The first one is effective age verification to prevent TikTok from processing data from people under 18 and under 13 and sorry. Second, proper data processing of people between 13 and 18 years old, especially to for your feet, dedicated to targeted advertising and the legal hypothesis used for relatively capable people. The ANPD carried out 
steps such as sending letters to TikTok requesting information on how data is collected, for what purpose, which the legal, which are the legal hypotheses, if the data is shared, and if there is any aid control tool, in addition to holding many different meetings. And one of the as one of the products of this work, a technical note was published with a series of determinations for adequating adequate children and adolescents data, data processing by TikTok. It includes a review on age verification mechanisms, a review on privacy policy, and reviews of cases in which legal hypothesis chosen was the legal hypothesis chosen was chosen by the execution of a contract. You can find information in our web website. Furthermore, in May 2023, an inspection process was initiated against seven teaching platforms at TACS. The first one, Centro de Mídias de Educação de São Paulo. Descomplica, Escola Mais, Estude em Casa, Explica E, Manga High, and Stud. Those are platforms um, platforms uh, that uh, became here really important after COVID. So the, uh, the process aims at investigating children and adolescents' personal data collection and sharing by ad decks or advertisement text, that is online advertisement companies. The ANPD carried out measures such as issuing letters and holding meetings. The answers to these questions and other documents are uh, on a process of analysis by the general inspection coordination. Now, if we are inspired by uh, international mechanisms or uh, other data protection authorities influence us. In other words, digital platform regulation in the global north can impact regulatory frameworks in the global south. We can say that one of the steps planned for any and all regulatory processes is performing analysis of international analysis. Experiences, I'm sorry including regulatory impact analysis provided for in Decree 10411 from 2020. And this is something mandatory. We have uh, to analyze experiences from different continents. We know, for example, that Europe has a great history related to privacy, like uh, uh, the GDPR. And it influenced immensely our uh, LGBT. But it's evident that while regulating our law, uh, we need to observe the reality of our country. It is important to highlight that the Brazilian society has its own characteristics and it's and it's much complex and diffuse. In Brazil, we have more than 200 million holders, which exceeds any European country. Personal data protection is something new compared to the time the subject has matured in other parts of the world. Europe formalized personal data protection in the 90s. It started as a recommendation, and here in Brazil, our general data protection law has been created for five years, and we almost achieved three years of the regulatory body. And in this short period of time, our contribution as a regulator meets the best global practices, not ignoring the characteristics of the Brazilian, of Brazilian society. One of our main projects is precisely to analyze different scenarios and build a Brazilian regulatory model that meets the desires and needs of our population. Of course, we do not ignore good international practices and we are attentive to what is working 
internationally. Furthermore, social participation is extremely important in the regulatory process. And the ANPD, since its creation, has made efforts to hold hearings and public consultations uh, in which we listen to all the interested parties, national or internationally. Uh, we do this to guarantee legitimacy to our regulatory process. And finally, the main challenges that the authority faces in its day-to-day -day activities regarding children's rights, I would say that it involves protecting children and adolescents' personal data. The challenge is immense in Brazil and around the world, not only because of the complexity of the topic and the need to make privacy protection compatible with the promotion of digital integration of these small holders. Of course, this uh, generates benefits, but also it is related to the importance of this population for the economic activities. Unlike previous generations, children are being introduced to the digital environment at an increasingly earlier age. And the personal data of these holders is not necessarily restricted to data consciously shared by them. It also includes data that can be obtained from their activities in the digital environment through cookies, location data, and other type of meta metadata. And it can even be done uh, based on expo exposure from their parents. Many children and adolescents are not sufficiently literate or capable of understanding the implications of the digital environment especially with regards to privacy and the use of personal data. To comply uh, with the 2023 regulatory agenda item relating to children and adolescents' personal data processing, the main uh, challenges we have been facing are being mapped out, but I can highlight uh, Issues related to techniques for measuring consent or measuring age of users of internet applications. Impacts of digital platforms and games on the internet on data protection of children and adolescents. Serving the best interests of children or adolescents personal data processing. And finally, possible risks that may involve children and adolescents in the scope of data protection in the digital environment. Maria, one fourth of Brazilian population is made up of children and adolescents. So it is a priority of the national uh, data protection agency. So protecting the data of these children and adolescents is a central uh, concern. Thank you very much for asking Brazil to share our status in this brilliant event. Thank you. Oh no, please, Did you go on. Thank you a lot. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Valdemar. It's very interesting and very important to have the Data Protection Authority saying that child rights is a priority, and we as a civil society are following this work and following the ad tax case, the TikTok case, and it's very, very important. And with kind regards, we thank you, Valdemar, for such a complete, uh, such a complete statement. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the panelists actually now we are going to open the floor for some conversation and i would just like to make a few remarks that as we're seeing from mikiko's speech from lily's uh, profound speech on uh, the reality of ghana on valdemar's challenges what do we see that in s the global south we have social economical challenges that impact the children's life and create uh, similar but different context for the digital challenges that we face. 
Uh, Lily talked about digital education, the need for digital skills, but it was also talked so much about platform responsibility. And for instance, in data protection issues, we had a, a, a situation where WhatsApp had terms of use that were more protective of European children than of Brazilian children. This is the inequality and the discrimination that Mikiko was talking about that in the, in the general comment. So how do we think about this? How do we think about this responsibility? And just to come up with something from Brazil, we have Article 227 in our constitution that says that protecting child's rights is a responsibility of the state, of the society, and of the family. So this is a responsibility of all of us, and by society we understand the platform responsibility to actually take active measures, transparent measures, and have accountability on what they are doing to actually improve child's well-being and experience on the digital platforms. So with that said, now I would like to open the floor. And I see there are some Brazilians here, and I know English can be uh, a difficulty. So if anyone wants to talk in Portuguese, we will uh, translate. We are very, well, we want to invite you guys to talk to us. Not only the Brazilians, but everyone, but just to open the floor for all of you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Wilson. I am youth in Brazil. Uh, I speak Portuguese, vou falar em português. <laughs> uh, a minha pergunta são três. Ai, I'm que bom poder falar em português nesse evento, English. gente, pelo amor de Deus. Going to ask é, primeira pergunta so vai para o Unicef, pensando na perspectiva uh, de regulação de plataformas que tem proibido temáticas LGBTQIA+ a partir da perspectiva de defesa dos direitos de crianças e adolescentes, como, por exemplo, o caso COSA, nos Estados Unidos, que tem vetado né, é, temas como LGBTQIA+, por dizer que isso influenciaria os direitos de meninos e meninas estadunidenses. Uh, his first question is, he wants to know about the LGBTQIA+, uh, rights, and how this may collide with actual regulations that we have right now. For instance, in the United States, with the Kids Online Safety Act, we have this discussion and this tension about how uh, child rights standards could be used to actually veto or take down LGBT content because of conservative groups advocating for it. Posso fazer inglês, amiga? Vou no meu aqui, vamos lá, então. The second question goes to Lily. How do you use technology as a way of emancipation the identities of children and adolescents from the online context, especially from the perspectives of the global south? Uh, three, three questions is... Uh, agora eu falo em português, porque é para o rapaz da NPD mesmo. Okay. A minha terceira pergunta é pensando na perspectiva de regulação de plataformas no Brasil. Eu queria compreender qual tem sido a ação da NPD na perspectiva, principalmente, de acompanhamento e monitoramento de checagem de dados, de idade, porque isso gera, né, tem uma correspondência com dados é, de crianças e adolescentes. Então, eu queria saber se a NPD tem olhado para isso e como tem acompanhado esse debate. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And just for the floor, his third question was about how the uh, Data Protection Authority in Brazil is following the age verification uh, measures and debates because this impacts the whole ecosystem. Sorry, just a, a, a Will, could you clarify the second one for Lily? She just wants to understand a little bit more. Uh, yeah, you have thank the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Stephen Foster. I'm from UNICEF. So firstly, thank you for the very interesting interventions. I had two questions, please. The first is, um, I'm looking at digital regulation like all of us around the world. It seems like we're at a point where there's a lot of regulation happening globally. Um, one around child protection, and this seems to be looking backwards. I mean, in the US, this is one country, but it's quite interesting that this year alone, there are over 140 state level, mostly state level regulations, or proposals rather. Um, and most of them will, won't be passed, but there's this kind of crazy rush, and a lot of it is looking backwards towards social media. And at the same time, we have AI regulation, that's very much a hot topic here especially and everywhere, which is interesting because this seems to be more forward-looking, which is encouraging. So I wanted to know if you agree with this reading um, that we seem to be in a, a time of heightened attention around digital regulation. Um, and then secondly, this point, the, the topic of today, of how do you get um, some sort of 
do you have models, let me put it this way, of, of how we get, like the general comment, you have certain standards or certain, um, certain measures that you would like in regulation, and, but at the same time, countries need to respond to their local context, you know, like the, the colleague from Brazil said. So do we have models where we, we have kind of consensus on a certain level, the minimum standards almost, um, of what we would like to see for child protection and empowerment, but at the same time, kind of differences that talk to the local context. And I just ask that because, the, you know, we generally think of regulatory fragmentation as a bad thing uh, because there can be fewer protections for children and less knowledge sharing and, and resource sharing. Um, but at the same time, there's almost an inevitable level of fragmentation because countries are different. So, yeah, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you a lot, everyone, for the questions. So we have one question about the Kids Online Safety Act and LGBTQ rights and how can we think about balancing this. Another question about uh, emancipating the identities of children and adolescents from the online content, especially from the perspective of the Global South. This one specifically for Lily. A question for Valdemar and the Data Protection Authority about age verification fiscalization measures and what the authority is doing with it. Uh, we have a question about the regulatory tension uh, that we are seeing in the world right now, and they cited AI and other emerging technologies. And the last question about do we have global standards that we can uh, actually apply, but seeing the local contents and how can we do this balance between local and global. So to wrap up, I will send specifically to uh, everyone to make your final remarks, but also answer the question with this. Can I invite Lily to start? All right, so uh, I'm going to start with the, the question about how to use technology to emancipate identities of people in the global south. So we have seen that technology, in essence, um, helps us to augment, uh, let's say, advocacy for children and allows us to, if, if we're doing something in a small scale, it can help us to scale it up. Now, for what I think that we can use, uh, how I think technology can help us in this space is the education creation, uh, awareness creation, and also aspects of just maybe online support or what we call, um, you know how we have a hotline for places, so you can do child support hotlines. So those are the ways, uh, I'm, I'm seeing those things as a way that we can help, technology can help us to be able to emancipate when it, when it comes to like just children things that are issues for them online and to provide support for them. Now, I'm saying this uh, against the background of how people encounter issues and probably do not know how to address them. So if they're new or they're equipped with knowledge, don't know how to better act. If they didn't know, is there support for them to like help them uh, go around what situations are existing. So I'm thinking in those areas of the just education, the awareness creation and support that exists, technology can help us do that. But in essence, we also have to know how to make sure that we are using it rightly. If somebody needed support online and somebody lied about being a support, that means a child has gone back into the hands of a predator or somebody that can harm them. So all of those things about literacy comes into play to, for us to be able to sift through what is right support and how we can also find the right information. There is this app search of misinformation and disinformation online. We can find the right things online with technology, but it will be hard for anybody who couldn't know what is right and what is wrong. So all those things can be found online and technology can help us to, in that way of education and awareness creation and support to be able to help um, children who probably have identities and issues around just um, rights online that are probably trampled upon. I'm going to attempt to uh, attempt the question around regulation, and I hear that there is a heightened conversation around regulation, and I see it across board. Everybody talks about emerging technologies, talks about privacy, talks about security accompanying them. Now, what looks what it looks like is there needs to be that balance. There is regulation to a, uh, to, that, to, um, to a certain extent that can stifle innovation, that can stifle even use of technologies for things that will be essentially helpful. Um, the conversation now about regulation looks as though it should lean more towards what you what we see as what are general guidelines? How can you contextualize for your for your particular scenario or situation where you are in the world? And um, for that to be helpful or beneficial to a community, 
there's a, there needs to be the presence of what we know as a multi-stakeholder representation for people to be able to um, put forward what it is that is helpful for them and, uh, and from their background and say that from our perspective, we want this to be added. It just promotes um, inclusivity, it promotes equitability, and just representation there. So regulation is re pretty much on top of things now, or on top of the conversation now because of the security issues you're seeing, privacy issues you're seeing, but there has to be the conversation going in such a way that in the long run, it's not stifling innovation and just even used for people who could ben benefit from just maximizing um, technologies if they knew how to. So, um, in running up, there is the support that we need that people can share best practices, learning from across the globe. That will be helpful for everyone. And so um, I'm pretty much all in for what is happening. How can we put some things or replicate some of these best practices in other countries for the global south and for Ghana, for instance. And so let's keep the conversation around um, sharing resources and support open. And who knows, we can move forward in the next year or two with some of the things that we are seeing as issues in Ghana around awareness creation, um, literacy, and just access. Thank you. Nikiko, would you? Thank you very much. <clears throat> so first of all, about the LGBTIQ plus um, rights. I think uh, this is a, one of the example of, um, why it is so important uh, to um, approach uh, this whole issue in a comprehensive, holistic way. And I think uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, provides uh, the, uh, such a legal basis uh, for the comprehensive approach. Uh, because when we talk about, for example, the protection of the children from harmful uh, online content, what are the harmful contents? So always uh, value judgments comes in. And so we uh, really have to think about uh, when we talk about harmful, uh, we also need to understand uh, the uh, children's rights in a holistic way, uh, including the non-discrimination against those children uh, who are uh, LGBTIQ uh, children. And for those children, uh, the online access and the digital platform is so important uh, to access the information and to get connected. And so uh, we really understand that aspect as well. And the age uh, verification, when the committee um, drafted uh, the General Comment 25, there was a lot of discussion about the age, uh, age uh, restriction or age verification. And uh, you, you know very well that Convention on the Rights of the Child is very much um, you know, dependent on age, cutting age, because the children are defined as all, all uh, human beings under 18. However, at the same time, uh, we don't really, you know, the convention is not really you know, restricted about by the age because we, the convention used the language such as age and maturity. So it's, it's a really challenging questions. Uh, can we really set the some, you know, access uh, issue uh, based on the age only? Uh, but uh, currently, the policy is very much using the age. So if uh, the age is used, uh, what the, the two questions are what is appropriate age for us, and secondly, verification. And uh, even on the offline uh, situations, uh, age verification is challenging. For example, uh, the, uh, still, uh, we haven't reached uh, the act the achieved universal um, birth registration, for example. And um, it's, not, it's not, no, uh, yet we went to the universal birth registration. So in this reality, uh, even on offline situations, uh, sometimes the um, uh, age ver verification or age determination itself is a challenge. But when it goes to the online situations, how really actually we can ensure uh, the application of certain age uh, policy, age based uh, policy. The committee doesn't have the answer, <laughs> really. So uh, it's a common challenge, I think, and we need to continue um, uh, discussing and finding some solution. Um, then uh, coming to the regulation issue. Um, yes, uh, I agree with you that we are talking a lot about uh, regulation. However, as the um, Sonia uh, spoke, uh, in the committee's drafting process, we also discuss a lot about the something like um, safety by design, uh, protection by design. But uh, is that considered the uh, regulation? 
uh, if it is the voluntary, um, you know, um, efforts by the business or the co code of conduct, but if it is becomes the regulation, it's again a regulation. So, and also we talked about uh, not only to protect the children uh, from uh, from risk and harm uh, by regulation or law or implementation, but also children need to be. Uh, supported and part uh, to gain the skill uh, to navigate uh, the uh, online because we cannot fully um, um, uh, fully um, take out all the harm you know from online. So I, I, this is the kind the committee's position the policy when we discuss the DGC 25 uh, regulation uh, and also empowering the children. Um, have to go hand in hand. So I think we also need to talk more about how to support the children and the parents and how to empower the children. That's my view, but I, I, uh, you raise a very interesting point, uh, such as uh, the fragmentation of regulation um, among the uh, states, but also the state, the, the regional, <laughs> I mean regional meaning the, um, the municipal levels or in the context of US uh, state level or in a federal countries a state level but uh, other countries um, there are municipal levels I think it's interesting yeah, because the committee uh, has a dialogue only with the states uh, state parties however many things are uh, concerning the children are happening and actually impacted by the municipal level uh, regulation on the programs or policies. So I, I think we really need to engage uh, with the municipalities or the state levels. And um, I don't know uh, how th those actors are here in this forum, uh, but uh, for example, the SDGs, uh, many you know, uh, municipal uh, levels uh, engaging with the SDGs. And so I think we need to uh, have more conversation at the the environment, because which is uh, um, c the environment closer to the children and uh, impacting the children. Finally, uh, also you raise a very interesting point uh, because it's not um, only about the uh, online child safety, but uh, about whole uh, children's rights. Because the Convention on the Rights of the Child is a universal or uh, international uh, standard. However, when it goes to the actual implementation, we really need to understand the. Um, context, context uh, the local context, uh, which doesn't mean that uh, we, you know, uh, we say that uh, cultural you know, issues uh, can be used uh, to justify non-implementation of the um, uh, international standard, but we really under need to understand. Uh, so I, I think uh, the uh, challenge for the committee, uh, we have a um, review, country review, country by country, and our uh, dialogue is focusing on one country, uh, but the, com the committee is not a forum uh, to collect uh, the good practices or compare. Uh, so I think the, th that kind of good practices uh, that uh, if we call um, the minimum uh, standard at the international level or fragmentation is not in a negative way, uh, but uh, the positive way uh, to find uh, good practices. So this kind of forum or other forums uh, or UNICEF work, I really appreciate you're collecting the data and also researchers and academia. Uh, we should learn from uh, those uh, who are collecting the, the information uh, who can help us to understand uh, how the international level of policy and standards uh, can be implemented in a positive way. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mikiko. Please, Baudemar, are you online? We have one more Vamos question. Lá. Nossa yeah. primeira pergunta foi relacionada à verificação da idade. A verificação da idade é, na minha age na minha... verification at the beginning of uh, my talk. I shared with you what we've been doing along with TikTok. Uh, age verification is one of our main concerns. Uh, we are checking if it's uh, adequate, if it's being performed, and to verify we can hire audit. And it's something very important in international level. We have to 
seek information from other bodies that have already dealt with the topic uh, that might help us. So sharing with other authority is important and sharing information with other bodies within Brazil. Uh, the, uh, the bodies that talk about this uh, topic is helpful. Now talking about implementation of regulations in Brazil, uh, we've been regulating, trying to regulate AI, and we have been discussing these topics in the National Congress, and the ANPD is always present in the discussions. We've been performing preliminary studies that show, for example, AI, when they deal with personal data, regardless of the technology that is uh, being used, it's foreseen on our LGPD, a certain uh, level of protection. And so we have been taking part on the missions in the Congress, and we have been sharing our positions and things that the ANPD has been implementing firmly. Thank you a lot. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for answering the questions in such a complete way. And we have one last question, uh, it's the final one, and then we do the final wrap up. Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, Francisco Olivardia from Panama. Um, after this interesting conversation, uh, I would like to ask, uh, what are your thoughts on using the existing international organizations like the Hague Conference on Private International Law, the OAS, the European Union, African Union, in order to move forward or to implement this uh, protection of the rights of the children in the digital environment? Thank you. I, I would give it a shot from the, the EU perspective. Um, I, was, I shared before that one of the things that has been uh, a hurdle in the past and in many le legislations or conventions on the continent has been implementation. And I, I see it as maybe a problem that is probably uh, because uh, the approach to it is pretty much generic. There could be city level, community level actions that can propel towards the implementation of the things that were listed probably in some of these conventions for child protection. I'll give an example. I have seen city level strategies of cities in the US that have gathered uh, or, 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 or sped off quickly because of a city level and community level. Nobody was waiting for um, state government to make, make a change. It starts from grassroots and then uh, rallying support and then moves upward. I'm thinking that once people know that these exist, first I'll see another problem would be they don't know that these even exist and can be guidelines. On the ground, then there can be guiding, um, guiding guidelines for them to be able to um, maybe help help with their processes and to and to follow some of the things that have been listed in there for the work they do in community level in city level in Ghana we have regions so in regional level that will be helpful to propel um, people usually just look for what the broader perspective is instead of taking it from pretty much the granular details and running with it I feel like that is how implementation can kick can kick start thank you thank you Lily you want to Thank you very much. Um, so my view is that uh, we should utilize whatever um, existing um, legal instruments and um, mechanisms, platform available uh, in an action-oriented way. Uh, this is uh, my challenge, um, you know, as a committee members. There are so many, you know, platforms, and uh, we really don't know who do what, and uh, the it's uh, really challenging. Uh, the committee on the rights of the child is one of the, you know, um, key 
mechanisms for the child protections. But uh, I, I was not aware of actually the IGF Internet Governance forums, Forum. And I, I'm learning a lot uh, sitting uh, yesterday and <laughs> today. And uh, it's so fast. Uh, everything is, uh, the discussion is uh, technology progress is so fast. And uh, we are not uh, fast enough, we are slow. And uh, the children, as I said, are all human beings under 18. When we were talking, for example, the general comment, uh, I said, uh, generally we uh, take two years uh, from the decision of the cho choosing the topic uh, and until the adoption of the general comment. In two years, children grow, and uh, 16 years, uh, children will be adult. And after the adoption of the general comment, we talk about implementation, how the general comment is used and in implemented. So it takes a lot of time. Uh, so I don't, I'm not in favor of uh, creating a new uh, instrument or new platform. Uh, my challenge is how we can use existing ones. But uh, to d do that, uh, what is the, you know, uh, because maybe you, you want to <laughs> respond to what I said. I, I understand that you are not suggesting, uh, but the challenge is that how uh, we can you know, effectively no, no, use... The, the, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to develop new instruments. I am saying like use the international organizations as instruments mm -hmm. for implementation. For example, in the HAC conference on private international law, mm -hmm. they used to develop like guiding principles, uh, model laws, uh, also like guidance for application of treaties. So my question is oriented not to develop new convention. No, 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 don't get me wrong. It's like using the international organizations as a vehicle for implementation. There's someone, maybe Valdemar wants to come in. Are you there? Ok. É, eu acho que o tema é, é, é importante. I think that it is an extremely important topic. And the more help we get, the better it is. So, working along with other institutions is central. Uh, Brazil is part of the hybrid American network, and within this network, we always rank priority priorities. And it is a we, it's a group that is made of uh, members of many different uh, types of uh, people from different uh, bodies. So this exchange of information and experience uh, amongst international bodies is something that is extremely helpful. It, it helps each country to develop their own policies. Okay, perfect. Is that good? I think now it is. We can have lunch together and talk, uh, talk more about later, okay. Mono, do you want to say some words to wrap up uh, before I finish? I think just one final comment. And it's very nice that we are here discussing digital platforms and digital regulation. But also on the videos that we saw at the beginning, the children were saying a lot about playing on the streets and these contents and that they don't feel safe for this anymore. And to think about child well-being in a holistic approach, we have to think about the safety on the digital environment. But it is also very important to think about the environment and how this affects children and on security of the cities and the right of children to play online safely, but to play on the cities safely and to have this holistic uh, approach for child uh, well-being. So I think this is very important so that we don't isolate the words because we live in the same world, the digital, the offline, the online, it's all mixed up right now. So how do we integrate this debate so we think uh, more broadly? And with this, uh, we are proposing, of course, seeing the general comment 25 uh, with uh, the general comment 26 that talks to the child rights uh, access to nature and the importance of this uh, dual approach for understanding child rights and this could be a discussion on the next IGF. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So 
I'm afraid you have to finish now, but we're so thankful for this session, and I hope you have learned uh, with it as much as I did. As Valdemar said, tomorrow is uh, Children's Day in Brazil, and we wish them and f them and, and all children an auspicious present and future online. Thanks once again, Mikiko, Lily, and Valdemar, Alana, colleagues, and everyone who joined us today uh, on helping us ra raise proposals on child's rights for and with the Global South and on international level. Thank you so much again. And uh, we have our colleague there uh, brought some uh, uh, example um, publication, co general comment 25. Is it uh, over there, here? Yes, anyone who wants to know it better is here. Juta, okay? Thank you so much once again. <laughs>